s'agit d'un film absurde sur une lesbienne enfermée qui se lance dans une tuerie au lieu d'admettre qui elle est. Sacré bleu. Hey guys, I'm Chris. Bonjour everybody, I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. And it is time for us to continue our Pride Month episodes. So last week, we took a deep dive into the talented Mr. Ripley. And this week, we're doing something a little bit more French. That's right. We are getting into the extremity of it all. That's right. We're going we're gonna to peruse all the extremities when we talk about high tension, or in its native country of France, haute tension. Haute. Haute. <laughs> also known as Switchblade Romance in some international countries, it's a 2003 French slasher film directed by Alexandre Aja, co-written by Gregory Lavasseur, and starring Cécile Dufrance and Mawen. The plot focuses on two female students who drive to one of their family's secluded farmhouse to study for their exams, where a murderer shows up on the night of their arrival. Often cited as part of the French extremity movement in horror films, High Tension was heavily edited for international release or outright banned in some countries for its violence, gore, and sexual subject matter. Oh my goodness gracious. How salacious. Okay, listeners. I won't let anyone come between us anymore. This is high tension. Marie, played by Cécile de France. And Alex, played by... <laughs> however you said it. Oh my God, I closed my eyes. That's where I was in Nice. My win. <laughs> are very close. Very, very close. So close that Alex has invited Marie to her family's remote farmhouse to study for upcoming exams. After introductions to Alex's family and a quick tour, the two decide to settle in for the night. Marie steps outside for a quick smoke and, perfecting her creepy stalking, watches Alex showering through the bathroom window. She then heads to bed for some alone bean-flicking time. <laughs> While listening to reggae. <laughs> <laughs> While she was upstairs hitting the kitten, Marie hears the doorbell ring, and Alex's father awakens to answer it. He opens the door to find a crazed killer who slashes his face with a razor. The killer places the father's head between two staircase spindles and uses a nearby bookcase to decapitate him, which awakens Alex's mother. What was that noise? She walks downstairs to find her husband dead and is accosted by the killer. Hearing the mother's screams, Marie quickly makes the room look like no one had been there and hides. After the killer inspects her room and finds no one there, Marie creeps downstairs and finds Alex chained and gagged in her bedroom. She promises to find help and sneaks into her parents' room, searching for a phone. Hearing approaching thuds, she hides in the closet and, through the door slats, witnesses the mother's throat being brutally slashed. Alex's younger brother, Tom, runs from his room, screaming for his mother, and the killer hears. He grabs a shotgun and follows Tom into a cornfield, where he shoots him. Marie returns to Alex, promising to free her, but the killer is returning. While Marie quietly creeps to the kitchen to grab a butcher knife, Alex is dragged to the killer's truck. Marie sneaks in to free Alex, but the two are locked in and the killer drives away from the bloody scene. When the killer stops at a gas station, Marie leaves the knife with Alex and sneaks into the shop for help. She hides in the shop when the killer enters and witnesses the killer murder a shop worker with an axe. The killer flees with Alex in the truck, but Marie uses the shop phone to call the police. She hangs up in frustration when she cannot tell him her location. She takes the shop worker's keys and chases the killer in his car down a deserted road. The killer notices her following him and rams the car, running Marie off the road. Injured, Marie exits the car and escapes on foot into the woods. The killer is in pursuit, but Marie bludgeons him with a fence post wrapped in barbed wire. 
While she inspects the body, the killer suddenly grabs her by the throat, and Marie suffocates him with a plastic terp. Marie returns to the truck to free Alex, who seems terrified of her and threatens Marie with a knife, accusing her of butchering her family. She slashes Marie's face and stabs her in the stomach. Meanwhile, the police have found the gas station and its murder victim. As they watch the surveillance footage, they see a crazed Marie killing the shop worker with an axe! Marie is a murderous, delusional lesbian and is deeply in love with Alex and is the killer of her family. The detectives head off to detect her, looking for any munched carpet. Okay, sorry. <laughs> they follow all the munched carpet directly to her. Alex has escaped Marie on foot, but Marie isn't dead. Marie grabs a concrete saw and chases after Alex, who flags down a passing motorist. But in a fit of rage, Marie climbs on top of the car and through the windshield disembowels the motorist with the saw. Alex grabs a crowbar and escapes, but a straight piece of glass slices her Achilles tendon. She cowers away, holding the crowbar, but Marie reaches her. She forces Alex to say that she loves her and kisses her, giving Alex the perfect opportunity to plunge the crowbar into Marie's dirty pillows. <laughs> While Marie falls to the ground, she repeats that she will never let anything come between her and Alex. Sometime later, while Marie sits in her psychiatric hospital room, Alex watches her through the one-way glass. Sensing her, Marie reaches out, lesbianly. The end. <clears throat> you know how people reach out lesbianly, right? Lesbianly? Lesbianly. They have a softball glove on and they're like, Come here. Uh, is that what all those people were doing in the lows? My <laughs> 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 High Tension was released en France on the 18th of June, 2003, and later that year screened the Midnight Madness section of TIFF, where it was purchased by Lionsgate for North American distribution. After being redubbed and heavily edited to avoid an NC-17 rating, the film was released in the U.S. on June 10th, 2005. So, two years after a France. Oh, wow. The film earned nearly 2 million opening weekends, securing the number 10 spot at the box office. But the film would quickly fade from the theaters, grossing only $3.6 million domestically. Worldwide, High Tension would only gross $6 million against a budget of $2.5 million. So I'm guessing that it did make a tiny bit of money. A little bit. Yeah, just I mean, a little bit. It doubled its budget. Definitely made a reputation, though. Most definitely, which I'm sure we'll get into. High Tension holds a 41% on Rotten Tomatoes with an audience score at 67%. The site's consensus reads, There is indeed a good amount of tension in this French slasher, but the dubbing is bad and the end twist is unbelievable. It also received a score of 42 on Metacritic based on 30 credits, classifying it as having received mixed or average reviews. Audiences pulled by CinemaScore gave the film an average grade of C-. Roger Ebert awarded the film only one star, opening his review, quote, The philosopher Thomas Hobbes tells us life can be poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So is this movie. <laughs> he added that the film had a plot hole that is not only large enough to drive a truck through, but in fact does have a truck driven right through it. <laughs> Gosh, even when Roger Ebert is bad, he's good. That's right. Always. Lisa Nesselson of Variety was more forgiving, saying that the film deftly juggles gore and suspense and has unnerving sound design. Has a sinister hobgoblin look that fits the story like a glove. James uh, Bertanelli. <laughs> you can say all these French words, but you can't say that. <laughs> it's Berardinelli. James Berardinelli. <laughs> James Berardinelli praised the film, writing, The film revels in blood and gore, but this is not just the run-of-the-mill splatter film. There's a lot of intelligence in both the script <laughs> and Alexandra Aja's direction. For those who enjoy horror films and don't mind copious quantities of red-dyed fluids, this is one not to be missed. It's a triumph of the grand... Oh, my God. Guinol. Guinol? What the yeah. fuck is that? How mordant. How, how deliciously mordant, James. The Village Voices' Mark Holcomb wrote that the film resembles, quote, a pastiche of 70s American slasher flicks that seemingly stands to add to the worldwide glut of icono-nostalgic sequels, remakes, and retreads. Ultimately seeing it as a, quote, gratifyingly gory, doggedly intellectually decon of the likes of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween, and surprisingly but aptly, Duel. 
Interesting. I can see all those things, right? And I, I think that it's kind of interesting to say that Alexandra Aja went on to direct like reboots of some very classic 70s horror films later on in his career. From right. The, the first thing that, that comes to mind is probably Maniac. You know, based yeah. on this, Maniac, you know? The Hills Have Eyes, right? right. And he's, yeah. He does follow well, Maniac because it's following the perspective of the killer, mm-hmm. right? Whether you know it or not, which of course is a tie-in with uh, our first deep dive of the month, which was Talented Mr. Ripley, mm-hmm. right? Where it's kind of following the slasher, although you're following his perspective, you don't really think of that he's the slasher until kind of the end when you realize, oh, yeah, he's doing all these things, yeah. Uh, there are some really good letterbox reviews, though. One was, <laughs> I don't think that's how lesbianism works. Anyway, did you see that dude's head pop off? <laughs> Second one. The scariest part of this was the dubbing I couldn't turn off. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm never trusting anyone who masturbates to reggae. <laughs> here, Why here. would you? <laughs> what an odd song. Although, like, it's really on the nose. It is. For, the like, the, the twist of this. And I was yeah. just like, oh, okay. You know, we'll talk about what the, what it's like to watch this movie on repeat viewings later yeah. on in this episode, I'm sure. sure. It does have some accolades. At the Golden Schmoes, it was nominated for Best Horror Film. At the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards, it won Best Actress for Cécile de France and was nominated for Best Wide Release Film and Best Makeup Effects. You're here. The Stygies International Film Festival, it won Best Director, Best Actress, Best Makeup, Grand Prix of European Fantasy. It was nominated for Best Film, but did not win. The film was included in Time Magazine's 10 Most Ridiculously Violent Films. Mm. Several viewers of the film noted striking similarities between the plot of the film and the plot of Dean Koontz's novel Intensity. When questioned at the Sundance Film Festival in 2004, the director acknowledged that he had read the novel and was aware of the similarities. On his website, Koontz stated that he was aware of the comparison but would not sue because he found the film so puerile, so disgusting, and so intellectually bankrupt that he didn't want the association that would inevitably come if he pursued an action against the filmmaker. Right. Very wisely. Yeah. Because if he had, then it would have been like all over the place and the film would have probably made billions more and yep. so much more money. Have been interested again. And I mean, like, honestly, and no offense to Dean Koontz fans, but maybe a little offense, like... Who cares about Dean Koontz? Well, before we get too much into this movie itself, I think we should back up a little bit. Let's zoom out and talk about French Extremity a little bit, or also known as um, New Extremity Movement. That's right. This movement in in cinema and in in horror has a lot of different names, right? But it's it's one of my favorite like subgenres of horror, right? I guess you can't even call it a subgenre so much as like a style of filmmaking. And it's not even really French. It's just French popularized it, and yep. they are. A, a big huge chunk of it yes very very much i feel like a lot of these movies sort of like came from france and a lot of these filmmakers are people that we talk about a lot today still in like horror horror adjacent circles sure right? so but basically it describes a range of transgressive films quote-unquote transgressive made at the turn of the 21st century that sparked controversy and provoked significant debate and discussion uh, they were notable for including, obviously, graphic images of violence, especially sexual violence and rape sometimes, as well as explicit sexual imagery, although I would say less in the torture porn variety. Yes. Uh, although I, I would almost say that some of the newest films in America now uh, are kind of coming back to uh, the French extremity of the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, which is that, that clown movie that just came out, right? Um, the sequel to terrified Ter- terrifier yeah. terrifier yeah, yeah terrifier yeah. and terrifier 2 come to mind yeah those are very much in like the torture porn kind of vibe right yeah but a lot of the movies that you would consider to be like french extremity um are not really horror movies at all right i mean they're kind of horror adjacent in some ways but movies like climax right or irreversible which uh, are both films by Gaspar Noé. Basically, every film by Gaspar Noé is is, fil- is uh, considered um, an extremity. Yes, I would completely agree with that. Right, I've seen I've seen many of his movies, not all of them, right, but they all sort of like fit that bill. Um, another director that you might consider to be French extremity, but is not his films aren't very French. Um, would be um, Lars von Trier, yep. right? Antichrist, mm-hmm. um, Nymphomaniac, correct. Yeah. Um, and then, like, it's not all French, right? Because these things kind of span the globe. So movies like a Serbian film would right. be considered to be very, very extremity. Would you say one of the earliest would be could be uh, Cannibal Holocaust? 
Yeah. So, and I feel like extremity reaches very, very far back, like back then. Right. So movies like cannibal Holocaust movies like Salo, right. Which, sure. are, which are things that we've talked about on this podcast, you know, um, would, would sort of fit the bill. It's sort of like, I wonder if even like Sebastian or whatever. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I think that's way more art house, you know, but I could I certainly see that movie as transgressive. There's a lot of like French horror movies as well, though. So something that's called like new French horror, but I just kind of lump them all into the new French extremity movement. So films like Martyrs or Frontiers, Calvaire, things like that are really, really good horror movies that I feel have something to say deep down. And even if you don't think there's a message there, really, like when I watch horror movies, I oftentimes want to be shocked. Right. It's just something that I've talked about on the podcast before is that I feel like a lot of things are very tamed. Yeah. I may get scared very easily, but I'm rarely ever shocked. And in a lot of these movies, I just am like yeah. they they go to places where I just would not expect it to go. They also have they tend to have a weird sense of like visual visceral realness to them. Very much. Right. Especially as we get into like the ones that probably some of our listeners are more familiar with, which would be like the quote unquote torture porn, which are really just extremity films. They are. Like Hostel, right? With the mm-hmm. blowtorch eyeball and stuff like that, or the the exploding when you're run over by a train. Saw, Wolf Creek, the human centipede, right? Um, those are all examples of what people were calling torture porn, but was actually just, you know, the new extremity movement coming out of France and much of Europe, starting with sometime in the 70s and then really just peaking in the, the early 2000s. Yeah, I would say that by the time that Gaspar Noé was starting to release films in France and definitely when Alexandre Aja was sort of getting his start over in France, we we saw filmmakers in America um really start to do those things too, especially in in horror films. So yeah. people like Eli Roth, right? Which is no stranger to our podcast. Um, and I desperately want to talk about Hostel sometime. Oh, sure. Because I think that when you think about torture porn or even French extremity or just extremity in general, I feel like that's like the poster child for that, right? Yeah. I feel like out of all the movies that have a kind of message behind its extremeness, like that's the one. I feel like there was a little bit of backlash, especially once the the word in popular culture was coined for torture porn, right? Mm-hmm. No one wanted to say with a word like that, with a phrase like that, no one wanted to say they liked torture porn, right? And so it, it made it almost impossible for the public to really like dig into that. And so they quickly kind of faded away in American audiences, or at least transitioned into the 2010s remakes that we all that we got, right? Uh, ending with, or at least um, I want to say peaking with, kind of. Alexander Aja's The Hills Have Eyes. So this guy like went kind of full circle with that trend. He uh, started this uh, this crossover into torture porn or the French extremity into the American mm-hmm. um, uh, pop culture cinema and ended kind of with The Hills Have Eyes, which was very, very um, extreme. I yeah, would say. it was a I very, mean, very – watch someone like remake. burn to death, mm-hmm. you know, without any kind of cuts. And so it's kind of – crazy you know but it's interesting that he's kind of bookended this this whole thing he was the very beginning of it and he was kind of the end of it as well and i mean it's it's safe to say that this film movement this filmmaking movement has not ended because just a couple years ago Tatane came out and kind of like blew everybody away at con oh sure you know Mm -hmm. like we just said tire fire right like now that that's taboos are less taboo like they couldn't have done all the sexual stuff in the early 2000s in the American cinema, but now they're starting to be able to, right? Yes. In addition to the violence, right? And so this 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 is a cemented genre. It's not going anywhere, right? Nope. It just floats around the globe a little bit and comes back and forth just like thrillers or slasher movies do, you know? It's now just permanent, right? Well, and I think it's become a lot easier to be able to say that you enjoy films like this. And I think that a lot of people are going back and they're watching some of these movies like Martyrs and, and so on that are very, very brutal and really, really hard to watch. And people are sort of giving them a second chance and saying that it's not just about the violence, the sexual violence or rape or anything like that. Like, I think the the films sort of have something to say um, and definitely has something to say about what it's like living in like a post 9-11 society. So it depends on the movie, really. Like, like certainly this movie, I would say that's very little on the on the way of message. No, but it's also a French film, you know, but some of these some of these American movies like Hostel and so on. Oh, sure. Hostel, definitely. Definitely have things to say about that particular time in America. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, because it's like, uh, I don't feel like French extremity or the extremity movement is any newer than say like the slasher. You could, you could point to movies as far back as like the twenties and thirties, you know, that are the dawn of the slasher or even extremity. Right. But the slasher had its, its peak in the eighties 
And the extremity had its peak in the early 2000s, mm-hmm. right? So it's just like, even though they're kind of the same, it's like you can see this ebb and flow. And, you know, like history continues. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, which subgenre of horror and, and uh, or horror adjacency is going to be the next peak, you know? That's right. Well, it is. And I love watching the cycles of horror. I just do. I think it's just really, really neat to see what kinds of movies are coming out, you know, like this year being no exception. Like mm-hmm. we all have the things that... Uh, we haven't seen in quite some time, which I'm sure we'll talk about a lot when it comes to the our end of the year episode. For sure. Let's talk a little bit about Alexander Aja himself. Uh, this is a guy that's today even only 45 years old. My goodness. Yeah. So he started really early. He made his first directorial debut at the age of 18 with a short film Over the Rainbow, which received a Cannes Film Festival Golden Palm Award nomination for Best Short Film. He was 18. My God, I've done nothing with my life. Yeah, and then he went on to do Furia uh, in 1999. And High Tension, he was 25, 24, 25 when he made High Tension. Even, maybe even younger based on when it was filmed in France, right? Right. Or not France, it was filmed somewhere else, but, you know, released in France. And then uh, by the time, three years later, Hills Have Eyes, 2006. And you might also recognize some of the other movies that he's done, Mirrors. Piranha 3D, mm-hmm. Maniac with Elijah Wood. We talked about that on Patreon before. Horns with Daniel Radcliffe. The Pyramid, which we have shat all over. Mm-hmm. Uh, Crawl, which I actually really liked. Oh, I love Crawl. Yeah. Uh, Oxygen, which was more recently, I think, on like Netflix. Yeah, just a couple of years ago it came out on Netflix. And upcoming in September, a movie called Never Let Go, which is a supernatural survival horror film starring Halle Berry. I feel like his career is super interesting, right? Like his early work is really over the top, very extreme. Really is. And he's gone much more, I feel like, in the mainstream area. Piranha yeah. uh, Pyramid seems like the most unlike Aja thing. Oh, for sure. Like ever. <laughs> like I, when I heard that he was making Crawl and I was like, Alexandra Aja is making an alligator movie. Like, like we'll see, you know, but it turned out to be really, really good. The thing is, is that I really like Aja's movies. Mm. Like I, I haven't been ever shy to say that even things like the Hills have eyes, which is really, really hard to watch in some places. I feel is a really good movie. Piranha 3D is incredibly fun, right? And it's just really fucking camp with its gore. And then you have something like Maniac, which is a super serious film. Like he he knows how to craft a good horror film and he knows how to like make you wince. And I think right. that that is talent when it comes to making horror. Um, and then like some things like Oxygen, which I haven't seen, but I hear was really good and is kind of more of a thriller than anything else and probably like his least gory oh, film. Oh, I heard the opposite. Really? Yeah. I didn't hear it was all that scary. Because I remember it was right after I moved from Boston Mm -hmm. and I heard bad things because I was interested in it. And then I heard bad things. And then I think some of our patrons even said um, it wasn't great. Uh, Although Crawl, I had watched that kind of in the pandemic. Yep. Uh, I had waited to see it until 2020, even though it came out technically, I think near the end of 2019. Um, And I I really, really adored that movie when it came out. I have never seen it again, but I, I think now that I'm thinking about it, I would. I would definitely see it again. Oh, for sure. I I think I would watch that movie many times. In fact, I think of everything here. Um, I think the scariest is probably Mirrors, the one that affected me the most, like as far as that. The funniest mm-hmm. is Piranha. Uh, the most effective is Crawl, um, and of course, the most tense is of course High Tension. Yeah. So he's got a lot of different movies, and I'm kind of intrigued by this uh, supernatural survival horror film. Um, and I guess Halle Berry needs some work. So, oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, Aja. So I don't know how much we can talk about this cast because I just I'm not super aware. Although, you know, our heroine slash anti-heroine slash murderer, Marie, <laughs> played by Cécile de France, I guess. So does that just mean Cécile of France? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, has been in a recent Wes Anderson movie, The French Dispatch, that was up for some Academy Awards. She just also does some voice work, uh, most notably maybe like Cars 2, although that was dubbed. OK. Right. She did that for the French version. So. Other than that, I'm not really super aware of her uh, filmography, So, but she's done a huge amount of film work in France. I feel like she dubbed her own voice in this, too. Yes, I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know anything about her. I mean, everything I, – I feel like I would recognize her if I saw her face, but solely from high tension. She's fairly iconic with her short hair here right. you know, in the, the cover of the movie. Like, I, I even remember the cover of the poster of this movie, mm-hmm. you know, uh, where she was kind of like Sinead O'Connoring all over the 2000s, you know, That's right. uh, horror poster boards. So, um, but next up we've got Mywin. I don't know why she's just like a single word, you know, uh, name here. Um, she's like Madonna or Cher, I guess. 
but I didn't realize who this was until I read about her. But she is, uh, she's the the French girl who essentially director Luke Besson started like dating when she was like a child. So oh, from like they that, met from when that she movie? was yeah. So she was she well <clears throat> she met when they were there's twelve and he was twenty nine. They began dating when she was only fifteen. <sighs> And in uh, 1993, at age 16, she gave birth to their daughter, Shanna. Oh, my God. Right. On the DVD extras of the 1994 film, Leon the Professional, Mywin said the film is based on her relationship with Besson because he co-wrote it. So when she was 20 uh, at the beginning of uh, filming The Fifth Element, which I love that movie, but he famously left her during the filming for the film's star, Mila Jovovich. And of course, I believe his wife plays the opera singer. Really? In blue. That's my yeah. one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it. I think so. Okay. Well, that's a very storied romance that they had. Crazy. You know? Uh, but they're they're both good. In this movie, I feel like uh, Cécile de France is better, right? I mean, but she uh, has more to do. And she- There's Certainly more to do. Has most of the dialogue in this movie, right? Because like, the other actress is gagged for most of it. Yeah. But, um, I mean, she does a lot of the heavy lifting- and it's a really, really physical kind of role for her. And I don't know. It's I, I think she does a good job. I think that she's believable. Um, you know, we didn't tell you guys that there's a twist before we started talking about the synopsis. But um, at the time of watching this movie, like, I didn't see that twist coming, really. So, I didn't either. And usually yeah. I see them coming. So I, I, I think that she did a good job sort of concealing that, you know. But when we talk about the plot and its holes, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking it was a straight A to B, you know, like Mario must save the princess from the castle, you know, type of situation. Right. And it was going to be like ending in some sort of explosion of gay love. But no, it totally twisted on me. And that's kind of what French Extremity does. They they take their main character and they put them in really, really horrible situations, you know. Um, and some things can be like really like misperceived yeah. whenever you're watching them. And typically in French horror films like that, these Extremity movies – the character has to get from point A to point B and people are dying around them until either the main character succeeds and survives or has killed themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just a very basic plot line um, with very little like twists. So, but this one certainly has one. Yeah. So speaking about the, the movie itself, I definitely have some feelings on the look and feel of it and how it was filmed and how it was pulled off. Okay. It definitely has this mid 2000s Zack Snyder oversaturation and contrast. To look at it, if you compare it with Dawn of the Dead that came out in 2004, it's very similar. Yes, I, I can I almost feel... guarantee you Zack Snyder kind of patterned the look of it after after this or something similar. And this is a very transitional time in the look of horror and action films. Um, I feel like between Matrix from 1999 and Dawn of the Dead 2004, you know, I want to call it the Swordfish look, which came out in 2001, because <laughs> Swordfish kind of copied Matrix, but then other things kind of copied it. Right. As far as like that high contrast, um, you know, uh, almost like that Michael Bay Transformers thing kind of took over later on. Like it just looks super oversaturated and re- re- kind of weirdly magazine-y in a way. And it makes it look dated now, uh, but still very stylized. Right. It's just a little bit too surreal to be, you know, to be taken seriously as like a drama for sure. Yeah, I would feel that the way that this movie looks, I mean, what what that one criti- that critic called it had a, a hemoglobin look to it, right? Sure. And that goes far beyond just saying that it's like saturated with blood. I feel like it was not a big green filter over it for like a good half of the movie. Yeah. And so I mean, like I, this movie is very very stylized Which in the is way Matrix, that it's made. straight up, yeah. you know. So, and and everything at that time period sort of had that. But you're right, it makes it look kind of dated because we were watching it last night. And I was like, okay, wow, I, it's been a long time since I've seen a movie that had that kind of like look to it. Oh, yeah. So we've moved past. I also kind of have a love hate uh, connection to the music, right? There's like this dissonant and uh, sounds like filled with annoying like frequency sounds and squeaks and stuff out of nowhere like um like bed creaking and stuff even though like she might be in a car or out in the wilderness or in a gas station or something mm-hmm. and it just sounds really kind of weird and like i thought at first i was like wow this is really interesting and, and good sound design but it just kind of got cloying after a while um although i do like the use of outside sounds that he used to interesting effects like wind rustling through trees crickets and things like that he would raise and lower the volumes of those to increase tension 
you know, if there's movement or if there needs to be silence or something like that. And he would do it kind of subtly. So like, that's why I say there's like love hate. Cause he really kind of overdid it with the dissonant, like whistle sounds like metal scraping metal in the soundtrack, which just had no diegetic meaning. And just kind of it, like I said, it kind of cloyed on me a little bit. I really like the sound in this movie <clears throat> because I think sometimes those things kind of throw you off or they kind of like adds to that like misperception. You really don't know what's going on because you're hearing things that don't necessarily belong in that particular moment. Right. And it keeps you guessing. But at some point, you know, I shouldn't be thinking, wow, they need to tone it down with the sound effects. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's enough with the cricket. Stop sir. with the soundboard. Aja. I mean, and I, I feel like a, a film Wolf Creek had kind of very similar moments in its score. Right. And I think okay. that I listed that on like my top 10 whenever we were doing that. Cause I really like the way that that movie does that too. It takes these like wire sounds like telephone wire sounds. Yeah. Like, and I feel like some of these movies from that time period sort of did that. People were playing around with some of these things. And, and to me, it sounds really good. Like I, I like, I like the music. I like the sound in this movie quite a bit. Yeah. I especially like some of the soundtrack like actual song songs. Oh no, this is one of the best uses of Muse song in cinema, mm -hmm. right, ever. Um, and the the use of Muse's song Newborn is used to great effect. I think at least twice in the movie, one in the beginning or one kind of in the middle and one kind of at the end when she's starting to do the chase. And it does feel like really, really good. Like the intro to that song and then how it goes into like a hardcore, like a uh, rock riff. Right. I really, really uh, love the use of that here. And I thought it was done to great effect. Well, and there's also really good use of like pop music, you know, like there's, there's kind of, it's like weird Euro, like old, like weird shit that they're singing to in their car. Like that I would never, you and know. And then it pops up again later on yeah. though, you know? And so like in a, in a moment in the film where you shouldn't be hearing a song that sounds very ABBA-esque, you know what I mean? Here it is. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel like they chose songs really wisely and I think the placement for them was used really wisely. And um, it's been a long time, you know, when I watch movies, and I'm like, that's a really good use of like that kind of music. It's like pop style music in film. It was all over the place, man. Because she's like masturbating to reggae randomly, yeah. and then listening to like French folk music in the car, like French pop folk, mm -hmm. and then they're playing Muse non diegetically, right? You know, so it's just it's really kind of fucking weird. And I think they just really didn't care. They really, really don't care. And we're going to talk about that more about what's happening um, on the screen uh, as far as they're really just trying to invoke a feeling and they don't care yeah. about it being realistic or not. No, I feel like the filmmaker used these songs intentionally. Oh yeah, very intentionally. Everything's yeah. very intentional in this movie. Well, we kind of have to talk about the elephant in the room uh, because this is the first time that I've watched this film uh, with the American dub i've never seen the american release version of high tension and it is horrible yeah the the they're even trying to make the sounds out of their mouths match the the lips and even with the same actors uh actresses in some cases it doesn't really work nope. like for the scene it doesn't seem like the sound like the echo or the reverb of a room matches what they're doing and then also randomly like half the movie's still in french with subtitles yeah so it doesn't make any fucking sense for the first half of the movie we have characters <laughs> speaking in english right and then for the last half of the movie the characters who were speaking english are now speaking french almost exclusively to the end of the film when they switch back to english which i i just don't understand that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I would like to think that American audiences are not that dumb, you know? Well, I mean, still, like, why wouldn't the whole thing just be dubbed? Or just be in French. I don't, <clears throat> yeah. Why Why is it half of it? Yeah, it makes no fucking and sense famously, to me. famously, everyone hates it. Yeah, I can see. I can see that because I loved this movie the first two times that I watched it. This is the third time that I've seen High Tension. And granted, I this was around like 2004. Like I, I wanted to see High Tension so badly, you know, because people were talking about it in horror circles and it was going to take a long time for it to get to America. But I was living in New York and, you know, the people back then, you know, in the early 2000s when I was living there, people sold like bootleg DVDs like on the street. Oh yeah. Right. I remember. And so I was browsing someone's bootlegs and I was like, the fuck you have high tension. Like, mm -hmm. let me just go ahead and get this. And it was the French version of it. And it was amazing. But now you can't find it. 
like anything that you want to stream for this movie is all the American dub version. And it's, yeah. um, it's really not good. So and, yeah, relatively yeah, speaking, but it's still the same movie. It's just like one is like a much better dub. That's less distracting because mm-hmm. eventually like you do get invested in the movie and the, the dub becomes less distracting, right? It's just very jarring, certainly for the first 15 minutes of this movie. Well, and that's where most of the dialogue is. I feel like once, once the true. action gets started, people just stop talking. Although, you know? and then they, when they do talk, it's in French again. So, right. and that's fine. So yeah. everything's back to normal. <laughs> that's weird. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Um, let's talk about some of the themes. Like we've really actually got a kind of a, similar theme to the talented mr ripley so it was very wise of you to kind of pick that second one here although they are certainly ripley is not an extreme extremity film no of course not you know it, they do have that kind of theme where this is kind of a cautionary tale about not coming to terms or being able to come to terms with oneself right or one's true nature this is true and i mean i feel like obviously High Tension takes that to some extremes. You Cartoonish know. and Muppety extremes. Very much. But you're right. I feel like Mr. Ripley and High Tension sort of work together, right? So I have been wanting to talk about both of these movies for quite some time. And then uh, a patron had also talked about Mr. Ripley. I'm like, perfect. You know, here it is for Pride Month. And I'm like, you know what? We're going to throw in High Tension because it's all about like – not quite living authentically and how that affects you as a character and sometimes to sort of like monstrous ways. Yeah. And it's like I said, cartoonish and Muppety Marie stares up at her friend through that window while she's showering and she experiences the male gaze. Right. And then she becomes the male gaze and it's absolute worse than final form. And it's, Mm -hmm. Toxic, violent, gory glory. And that's right. For the rest of the movie, all she had to do was see her love interest showering. And she's like, well, I'm going to go kill her little brother. So there's a, a big contention here, not just on letterbox, but also in like the critic space and audience space, obviously, where it's like, OK, this is what it's about. But does it actually like have a moral stance? And a lot of people think it does, or at least a, like kind of an incidental and reckless one that seems kind of either incidentally or in, or truly homophobic to a lot of people. Okay. One letterbox reviewer said, quote, it's been said by others already, but the twist ending turns this dull tortured slasher into an outright ableist homophobic slog. It spends a lot of time indulging in graphic violence, sexual exploitation and absurd amounts of blood, like really absurd. I mean, to the point where it feels cartoonish. It's not just that it engages in two very harmful stereotypes for its twist ending is that it also uses queerness and mental illness as more shocks. Not only does it contribute to the stereotyping of both, but it also makes sure we know the filmmakers consider both of those things alarming. It tacitly compares queer lust to patriarchal objectification and violence, showing that either the men who made this cannot conceive of attraction outside of these bounds or actively want to demonize it. This is infuriating trash that doesn't even have the weak contextual defense of being, quote, of a different era. Damn. I mean, that's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I wouldn't go so far. I think it's more incidental. Yeah. It feels more like less of a statement. Right. It's way too lazy for that. <laughs> it's 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 less of a statement. It's more about like sleepover camp. Right. Where they're really just trying to do a twist at the end. That's shocking. They're not trying to make some sort of statement on trans people or they're, you know, crazy. Maybe they were as incidental because it was pop culture at the time. Yeah. It's right? all about shock. Sorry if you've if you haven't seen sleepover camp. Oh, true. Big shocker. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like this, right? He was trying to do that. And in kind of an homage to the 70s and 80s films that he and his friend grew up with because his friend helped him write this movie, right? And so that's all it is, is he's trying to invoke a feeling and make a vibe. And he doesn't care how facts work, right? Because like when we get down to that twist, it's like Roger Ebert attributed to plot holes, right? Uh, like the truck itself, like she's she's actually with her friend as the truck's pulling up. And like we see the trunk at the beginning with the, you know, fucking the decapitated head or whatever, you know. And and then the like, people start kind of doing the mental acrobatics as an option here, which is totally viable because film is subjective. You know, art is subjective. And they say this. OK, well, it all makes sense because it's an unreliable narrator. All right, that's fine. But to me, it's that third thing, right? It's just lazy as fuck with a story that serves the twist instead of the twist serving the story because he's trying to make a vibe, not tell some sort of like fucking true crime story, right? 
Well, that's right. And I, I think that it's it's all of these things. Like, there's, there there are definite plot holes. She oh, is an yeah. unreliable narrator. Yeah. The third thing was supposed to be all of the above. Right? Yeah. <laughs> really. well, yeah, you're right. and But it is. I mean, it's really just, I mean, it's kind of lazy. The thing is, is that, like, like we talked about with these other French extremity films, there is a big, like, ongoing theme of, like, misperception through all of these movies. And things in French extremity don't always appear to be what they really are, right? And you can't really know what's going on in some of these movies. So, well, I, th- I think we do hear a little bit. I, I don't think that the, there was a lot of thought behind it. I think it was just used as a shock, you know, and I don't think they could do that today. And I don't think they, that Alexander Aja would do that today because it's kind of, it comes across now as kind of punching down, yeah. right? Ableist homophobic, but I do think it's in- incidental here. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, you know, yeah. that he was literally just trying to give audiences a really, really, you know, rough ride. Well, and I also think that, like, having a queer villain is nothing new in cinema, right? And I... Oh, yeah. Just, like, watch Disney. <laughs> well, even things like, like, Freebie and the Bean and stuff like that from, like, the 70s where there's... Or, um... If I was fucking that parrot. <laughs> what the fuck is that? The Palma movie I like so much, you know? Dress to Kill. Dress to Kill, you know? Like, or even Cruising, which we've talked about on the it's podcast. It's all over, yeah, of yeah. course, you know? So I, I think it's, I, I don't think it's right to say that it's homophobic, you know what I mean? I Like, this is just this person. And a lot of people, a lot of gay people have... They just didn't say the quiet part out loud. <laughs> right. A lot of gay people, like, have problems coming to terms with their sexuality or whatever. It doesn't make them bad, you know? But, like, and I don't think that her being a lesbian... Uh, provoked her to do these bad things, I feel like it was just her love, really. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's not a great way to show it. They could have done it a billion better ways, and I think they would today. Yeah, I because do. this is just lazy. Well, and I still think that, like, there was probably more rampant homophobia. Well, she's already a lesbian, so she's already crazy, you know? So it's like, come on. Things in 2003 to 2005 are different than they are today oh, when it sure. comes to queer people, right? And how they're represented in film. So, I mean, like, obviously... Like it's, it's also a product of its time too. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Uh, speaking of product of its time, there was too much to show in this movie, yeah. which is why a vast majority of it, not a vast majority, but a majority of the violence in it had at least some censoring. Right. Uh, this is the first time that I haven't seen the unrated French version too. So this is the first time that I've seen this movie where they took out some of the gore and violence. Right. So obviously a lot of scenes were added for the American version to achieve that R rating, um, so about one minute of the film was cut in order to avoid the NC-7 rating. But when you're talking about gore and, and edits, like that's a long time. Yep. The R-rated edition was released in American cinemas um, in a less widely circulated full screen DVD and on the streaming service Tubi. I have a list here of all the things that were cut. Okay, let's see if I notice them. All. So Alex's father is graphically decapitated with a bookcase, his uh-huh. headless neck spraying with blood. In the R-rated version, the murder is edited to quickly cut away from the bookcase crushes and severs his head. Later, the body is seen on the staircase without the head. Yep. But you can still kind of alludes, right? Sometimes cuts are worse. Right? Well, you see the head kind of tear away you, from the you, body. You do. And that's you it. Totally see it. But, <clears throat> man, this is the first real kill in this movie. And I remember watching that that French version, and I was just like, what the fuck? Because high tension was really kind of like my introduction to what French extremity is. Oh, and yeah. I kind of sought it out afterward. And that first head spring, all that blood, even though I've seen things like it before, it looked a hell of a lot more real than some of the 70s and 80s stuff that I had seen. So it was really shocking. The next one is when Alex's mother has her throat slashed, the scene is shortened. Most of the arterial, spurt- arterial spurting as the killer pulls back her head is gone. Mm-hmm. Subsequent shots of Marie inspecting the body have also been edited. Now we do see a long, a fairly long cut of the blood hitting the blinds as she's looking through it. Correct. But we don't see it actually spurting from the neck. Nope. Um, and then we are... We, we have a moment where she's like talking to her mom a little bit. And so like blood's coming, like gurgling out of the, the cut, but that's about it. Yeah. The death of Jimmy, uh, the gas station clerk was also shortened. A close up shots of the ax sticking in his chest had been removed. Yeah. That one wasn't quite as noticeable to me. It seems like a little bit more intact. Yeah. Then the scene where Marie strikes the killer's face, the barbed wire pole is shortened and less explicit Marie hits the killer fewer times and fewer details of the killer's wounds are shown. Yep. Although that was pretty gnarly. 
It was. I, I like that kill. I like that weapon, actually. The driver's disembowelment. When the concrete saw was shortened, I saw what it was doing and kind of through the window and how they cut it. And I was like, oh, my God, that's the one I would lo- love to see, like, the full version of. Because, you know, they use, like, a full body uh, fake. Yeah, and that is for sure the moment that I noticed the most. Aside from the, the neck squirting blood, the disembowelment with the concrete saw was drastically different. I feel like that's where most of that minute comes from because it is extended yeah. and fucking graphic and really gnarly and nasty um, in the other version of this movie. And this one made it seem like tame. It's still shocking and, and really, really violent. But um, like watching that is just crazy in the other version. Uh, finally, a close up of the crowbar and Marie's shoulder is missing. So I don't really care about that one. I don't know why that would be because yeah. it's through her shirt, you know? Yeah. I, it's it's, you, I feel like you could have that. In She's like movie. slashed all over her face anyway, right? Well, and there's <laughs> already been blood everywhere. She just disemboweled somebody. Oh, that car. Yeah. I, I <laughs> feel like. Covered in blood. I feel like we could just show the crowbar at this point. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's different, you know? And it was a different experience watching this. Um, with with less violence, I feel like for a French extremity movement to succeed, it has to have all the things in it that make it French extremity and violence is one of those. And when you take it out, it kind of detracts from the movie, which can lead into some of our questions is high tension, a horror movie. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, obviously. Right. Were you scared while watching high tension? No, I was were tense. You, were, were you tense while watching <laughs> I high was tension? tense. Um, I wouldn't say that I was scared watching it the first time. I was certainly tense. Um, and the thing is, is that like every movie with a twist and then even movies that are considered to be shocking in like horror films are kind of less so when you watch them a second time, no matter what. That just happens because you've seen it already. I feel like the only time I actually jumped in this was with like, like was a mirror gag or something with mm-hmm. the, the friend behind her. It wasn't even like a, a horror moment. Yeah, it wasn't even supposed to be, I guess, yeah. you know. But like having, knowing what's going to happen, right? And knowing what the twist is and knowing where the violent moments are, watching this for a second or third time, to me, kind of take away from the fun of watching it. You know, as weird as that might sound for watching something this violent, but um, it's certainly less tense and less scary on a second or third or fourth watch. Yeah. Uh, Out of five stars, what would you rate high tension? I had a lot of problems with this one, um, but I still like it and I really want to see the original version, the uncut in all its French glory. And so I give this version a three. It'd be interesting to see if I watched the original, if it would jump up to a three and a half or even four. Well, I feel like um, watching it not dubbed. Would it just the dub, it? like not even yeah. like the extra gore, you know, mm-hmm. like it just kept taking me out of it. Yeah, agreed. So I rated this movie 3.5 stars on this watch. So it's like you have to be immersed in a, in a story like this to mm-hmm. be tense and everything else. The fact that I was that tense, even without being immersed and being actively annoyed by that dub um, half the time, like... Obviously, the movie is doing its job and it's talked about still today for a reason. So, like I said, I really need to, to – we did, listeners, think that we had that version. Yeah. But it, it low has been lost, unfortunately. Well, I still have the bootleg, but I have no idea what that quality is like. You know what I mean? I wasn't about to bring that over. Yeah. Um, I gave it three and a half stars and I feel like the first time I watched this movie, it would have been closer to four Maybe even four and a half just because I liked it. I found it incredibly shocking and it really introduced me to uh, just new ways of watching movies, you know, and in a couple of years or a year or so later, Hostel came out and just completely changed my life. So um, I owe high tension a lot of debt. Um, And the final question. And for this movie, some would say, why? Who's the hottest guy in high tension? Marie. <laughs> Marie. <laughs> yeah. She's kind of, she's really hot. Like <laughs> I am a homosexual through and through. Which is very pretty androgynous in some but, cases, but yeah. weirdly sexual at the same time too, which was on purpose, obviously. She's got a whole Ripley thing going on, you know. For sure. And the way that she handles that saw, you know, oh, I'm yeah. like, come on. But yeah, so um we'll just say that she's the hottest person 
and high tension. There you go. For yeah. sure. Because I guess the only other, it certainly can't be the killer. His fingernails are gross. Oh, God. Those fingernails were the grossest thing in this whole movie. <laughs> I mean, disembowelments aside. Besides the dub. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then uh, the fucking like sh- gas station clerk. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you have some fun facts for me? I do. I have like four. So according to the director, the screenplay version of the film had the entire movie for Marie's version of events. You didn't find out she was a killer until the very end of the film after Marie defeats the killer and rescues Alex. When it would cut back to the hospital room and you would see Marie in handcuffs, a police officer would roll in a TV and show Marie the video of her killing the gas station attendant and ask if she wanted to change her story. So the real version of events was meant to be another movie entirely. However, when the writers presented the script to Luke Besson, he convinced them to change the ending to include the last reel of the film revealing Marie as the killer instead of the last five minutes. I don't know which version I would like better. Yeah, I was thinking like when it was revealed, I was like, why didn't they hold on to that? Why didn't they just hold on? And like we just wondering why the and I feel like it just cut some frustration. So Luke Besson is the one that saw that cut or that at least the, the script for it. Right. Luke Besson's a good filmmaker, uh, although apparently a child rapist. I don't fucking know. I mean, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I kind of I kind of like the moment where we see her on that surveillance thing. I mean, because at the time, the first time I watched this movie, I, d- I did not see that coming. And um, I don't know. It just really, like, made my jaw drop. And I was like, the fuck you say? Mm-hmm. You know? So... Uh, next up, according to Alexander Aja, the scene where Marie hides from the killer in the gas station restroom is an homage to a similar scene in Maniac, the original from 1980. And of course, the axe murder of the uh, gas station worker was actually an homage to The Shining. It looks just like it. Yeah, it does. Mm hmm. Next up, the vast majority of the film was shot on location. The only studio filming done was shooting the scenes between Marie and Alexia inside of the killer's truck, which was actually in just a fucking garage. (laughs) lastly the camera used during the car attack scene got so much fake blood on it during shooting that when it was being used on another film later some fake blood oozed from it during the focusing of a shot (laughs) jesus (laughs) wonder how much later (laughs) in what film (laughs) for real i kind of want to go watch it now because it seems like that car should have been destroyed i'm like (laughs) (laughs) Why didn't they just get rid of the car and use another one for that movie? I don't understand, but Why does this car smell like corn? (laughs) (laughs) Those were fun. I think that just about wraps up this episode of the Film Flamers. As always, we want to know what you think about High Tension. Have you seen this dubbed version? Let us know what you think. You can find us on social media at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the things. You can email us at tiredqueensatfilmflamers.com or call our hotline at 972-666-7733. Call our hotline and win a free concrete saw. Don't scissor me. Saw me, baby. <laughs> Uh, That also wraps up our content on the main feed for this Pride Month. But we do have a bonus episode coming out for you over on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com slash the film flamers. You join the family and hear our bonus episode on what film, Chris? Stage Fright with an amazing cast that includes a side of meatloaf. Oh, I do love meatloaf in movies. He's missed. We are inching ever closer to 100 ratings and reviews over on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. Guys, head over there. Leave us a five-star review. Tell us why you like it. We're going to read that on an upcoming Shooting the Flames episode, and you'll help us get ready to be on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, Robert. Yes, Chris? I think I'm ready to have some sweet Sweet dreams. dreams. Hypotension? Hypotension. That's right, not hyper- the medical drama. <laughs> <laughs> it totally changes the movie. Hypotension. That sounds boring. 